statement, the Chancellor of the Exchequer. <laughs> Chancellor George Osborne. Mr Speaker, this coalition came into office with a commitment to address, with firmness and resolve, one of the biggest economic crises of the post-war era. And the action we have taken, together with the British people, has brought the deficit down by a third, helped a record number of people into work, and taken our economy back from the brink of bankruptcy. Yeah. And it allows us to say that while recovery from such a deep recession can never be straightforward, Britain is moving out of intensive care and from rescue to recovery. Yeah. <coughs> Today we announce the latest action to secure the recovery. We act on behalf of every taxpayer and every future taxpayer who wants high quality public services at a price our country can afford. We act on behalf of everyone who knows that Britain has got to live within its means. And we have applied three principles to the spending round I set out today. Reform to get more from every pound we spend. Growth to give Britain the education, enterprise and economic infrastructure it needs to win the global race. And fairness, making sure we are all in it together by ensuring those with the broadest shoulders bear the largest burden. And making sure the unfairness of the something for nothing culture in our welfare system is changed. Mr Speaker, we've always understood that the greatest unfairness was loading debts onto our children that our generation didn't have the courage to tackle ourselves. We've always believed, against much opposition, that it is possible to get better public services at lower cost, that you can cut bureaucracy and boost enterprise by taking burdens off the back of business. And in the face of all the evidence, the opposition to these ideas has collapsed into incoherence. We've always believed that the deficit mattered, that we needed to take tough decisions to deal with our debts, and the opposition to that has collapsed into incoherence too. Today I announce the next stage of our economic plan to turn Britain around. Mr Speaker, let me start with the overall picture on spending. In its last year in office, the previous government was borrowing one pound in every four that it spent. It was a record for a British government in peacetime and a calamitous risk with our economic stability. As the notes we saw again this week from their outgoing Chief Secretary put it, I'm afraid there is no money. So we acted immediately. Three years ago, we set out plans to make savings and to reduce our borrowing. And instead of the £157 billion the last government was borrowing, this year we are set to borrow £108 billion. That is £49 billion less in borrowing. That's virtually the entire education budget. So we made real progress, putting right what went so badly wrong. But while we've been acting, the challenges from abroad have grown. A eurozone in crisis, rising oil prices, the damage from our own banking crisis worse than anyone feared. And the truth is, Mr Speaker, we have to deal with the world as it is, not as we would wish it to be. So this country has to continue to make savings. I can report to the House that the biggest single saving we've made in government is the £6 billion a year less we are paying to service our debts than the previous government budgeted for. Bear that number in mind when you hear the opposition complaining about cuts. Mr Speaker, the deficit has come down by a third, yet at over 7 per cent it remains far too high, so we must continue to take action not just because it's wrong to go on adding debts to our children's shoulders, but because we know from the global turbulence of the last few years that the economic risks are real and the recovery has to be sustained. And if we abandon our deficit plan, Britain would be back in intensive care. So the figures today show that until 2017-18, total managed expenditure, in other words, the total amount of government spending, 
will continue to fall in real terms at the same average rate as it is falling today. The task before us today is to spell out what that means for 2015-16. Total managed expenditure will be £745 billion. To put that huge sum into context, consider this. If government spending had been allowed to rise through this Parliament at the average rate of the last three decades, that total would have been £120 billion higher. This government has taken un- Order! Order! The Chancellor must not have to shout to be heard. Members know that I will always accommodate the interests of backbenchers on both sides in scrutinising these matters intensively. But the Chancellor and, in due course, the Shadow Chancellor must be properly and fairly heard. The Chancellor. Mr Speaker, this Government has taken unprecedented steps to achieve this expenditure control. But now we need to find £11.5 billion of further savings, and I want to pay a personal tribute to my right honourable friend, the Chief Secretary, for the huge effort he has put into helping to deliver them. Now, finding savings on this scale has not been easy. These are difficult decisions that will affect people in our country. But there never was an easy way to bring spending under control. Mr Speaker, reform, growth and fairness are the principles. Let me take each in turn and start with reform and the obligation we all have in this House to ensure that we get more for every pound we spend of taxpayers' money. And with the help of my right honourable friend, the Minister for the Cabinet Office, we have been combing through Whitehall, driving out costs, renegotiating contracts and reducing the size of government. Cutting money the previous government was spending on marketing and consultants, reforming government IT and negotiating harder on behalf of the taxpayer has already saved almost £5 billion. In this spending round, we find a further £5 billion of efficiency savings. That's nearly half the total savings we need to achieve. We're reforming pay in the public sector. We're holding down pay awards and public sector pay rises will be limited to an average of up to 1% for 2015-16. But the biggest reform we make on pay is to automatic progression pay. This is the practice whereby many employees not only get a pay rise every year, but also automatically move up a pay grade every single year, regardless of performance. Now, some public sector employees see annual pay rises of 7%. Progression pay can at best be described as antiquated. At worst, it's deeply unfair to other parts of the public sector who don't get it and to the private sector who have to pay for it. So we will end automatic progression pay in the civil service by 2015-16 and we're working to remove automatic pay rises simply for time served in our schools, NHS, prisons and police. The armed forces will be excluded from these reforms. Keeping pay awards down and ending automatic progression pay means that for every pound we have to save in central administration, we can better limit job losses. I don't want to disguise from the House that there will be further reductions in the number of people working in the public sector. The OBR has forecast that the total number of people working for the government will fall by a further 144,000 by 2015-16. And I know that for those affected, this is difficult. That is the consequence of the country spending far beyond its means. When I presented the spending round three years ago, I said then that around half a million posts in the public sector were forecast to have to go. That is indeed what has happened. And we're saving £2 billion a year with a civil service now smaller than at any time since the war. But I also said three years ago that I was confident that job creation in the private sector would more than make up for the losses. Now, that prediction created more controversy than more almost anything else at the time. This is what the opposition said. The Shadow Chancellor called it a complete fantasy. Instead, every job lost in the public sector has been offset by three new jobs in the private sector. year, five new jobs have been created for every job cut in the public sector.
and the central argument of those who fought against our plan is completely demolished by the ingenuity, the enterprise and the ambition of Britain's businesses. And I pay tribute to the hard-working people of this country who prove their pessimism wrong. Now, Mr Speaker, in this spending round, the Treasury will, as you would expect, lead by example. In the 2015-16, our resource budget will be reduced by 10%. The Cabinet Office will also see its resource budget reduced by 10%. But within that, we will continue to fund support for social action, including the National Citizen Service. 90,000 places will be available for young adults in the Citizen Service next year, rising to 150,000 by 2016. It's a fantastic programme that teaches young people about their responsibilities as well as their rights, and we are expanding it. Local government will have to make further savings too. My right honourable friend, the Community Secretary, has set an example to all his colleagues in reducing the size of his department by 60% and abolishing 12 quangos. He is the model of lean government. He has agreed to a further 10 per cent saving in his resource budget. But we are committing to over £3 billion of capital investment in affordable housing and will extend the Troubled Families programme to reach 400,000 more vulnerable families who need extra support. We are proving that you can save money and create more progressive government, and that is the right priority. And here is another of the government's priorities helping families with the cost of living. Because we know times are tough, we have helped to keep mortgage rates low, increase the personal allowance, cut fuel duty and we have frozen the council tax. That council tax freeze is due to come to an end next April and I don't want that to happen. So I can tell you today that because of the savings we have made, we can help families with their bills. We will fund councils to freeze council tax for the next two years. Yeah. That's nearly £100 off the average council tax bill for families. That brings savings on these bills for families to £600 over this Parliament. And it demonstrates our commitment to all those who want to work hard and to get on. Yeah. And there's one more thing that we can do to help with the cost of living in one part of the country. For years, members from the southwest of England have fought on behalf of their constituents who face exceptionally high water bills. Nothing was done until we came to office. Now we've cut those water bills by £50 a household every year until 2015. My honourable friend, the member for Camborne and Redruth, and many others have campaigned to extend that rebate beyond 2015, and I'm happy to confirm today that we will do that. Yeah. Taking money out of the cost of government and putting it into the pockets of families, that is what we mean by reform. Local government has already taken difficult decisions to reduce staff numbers, share services and make savings. And I want to pay tribute to Sir Merrick Cockle for all he has done in showing how this can be achieved. We were told by the scaremongers that savings in local government would decimate local services. <coughs> Instead, public satisfaction with local council services has gone up under this government. And that is because, with our reforms, communities have more control over their own destiny. That's because we've devolved power and responsibility to manage budgets locally. That's because we've let councils benefit from the tax receipts that come when the local economy grows. Today, today we give more freedom including greater flexibility over assets, and we will drive greater integration of local emergency services. And again, I want to thank the Honourable Member for Bournemouth East for his fresh thinking in this area, which has helped inform us. We also are embarking on major reforms to the way we spend money locally through the creation of the single local growth fund that Lord Hesseltine proposed. This will be £2 billion a year. That's at least £10 billion over the next Parliament. And that, local, that is a sum that local enterprise partnerships can bid for. The details will be set out tomorrow. And our philosophy is simple. Trust people to make their own decisions, and they will usually make better decisions. But in return for these freedoms, we have to ask local government for the kind of sacrifices central government is making. 
The Local Government Resource Budget will be reduced by 10 per cent in 2015-16, but when all the changes affecting local government I will set out are taken into account, including local income and other central government funding, local government spending reduces by around 2 per cent. I set out today the block grants to the devolved administrations. Because we have prioritised health and schools in England, this feeds through the Barnet formula to require resource savings of around 2 per cent in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. The Scottish resource budget will be set at £25.7 billion, and Scotland will benefit from new capital borrowing powers of almost £300 million. Being part of the United Kingdom means Scotland will see its capital spending power increase by almost 13 per cent in real terms in 2015-16. It is rightly for the Scottish Parliament to decide how best to use it. That is devolution within a United Kingdom delivering for Scotland. The Welsh resource budget will be £13.6 billion, and we will shortly publish our response to the Silk Commission on further devolution of taxation and borrowing. When we do so, we will be able to say more about the impressive plans to improve the M4 in South Wales that my honourable friend from the Vale of Glamorgan and others have been campaigning for. And the Northern Ireland resource budget will be £9.6 billion. We have agreed to provide an additional £31 million in 2015 to help the police service of Northern Ireland tackle the threat posed by terrorism. Those police officers do an incredibly brave job on our behalf, and we salute them. Separately, we will make 10 per cent savings to the Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland officers. Mr Speaker, we believe that the, culture, the cultural heritage of our nations are not just an economic asset, but have an intrinsic value too. And when times are tough, they too must make a contribution to the savings this country requires. The Department for Culture, Media and Sport will make savings of 7 per cent in its resource budget. Elite sports will be protected, while the funding of community sports, arts and museums will be reduced by just 5 per cent. But because we recognise the value of our great museums and galleries and English heritage, we are giving them much greater freedom from state control, which they have long called for, applying our reforming principles across the board, empowering those on the front line who know best what the director of the British Museum calls good news in a tough economic climate. And while we're at it, we will make sure that the site of the Battle of Waterloo is restored in time for the 200th anniversary to commemorate, to commemorate those who died there and to celebrate a great victory of coalition forces over a discredited former regime that impoverished millions. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we still have the finest armed forces in the world, and we intend to keep it that way. The first line of national defence is sound public finances and a balanced defence budget. My honourable friend, the Defence Secretary, is helping to deliver both. He and his predecessor, my honourable friend for North Somerset, have filled the £38 billion black hole they inherited in the finances of the Ministry of Defence. Now we continue to ensure we get maximum value for money from what will remain at over 2 per cent of our GDP, one of the largest defence budgets in the world. The defence resource budget will be maintained in cash terms at £24 billion. The equipment budget will be £14 billion and will grow by 1 per cent in real terms thereafter. We will further reduce the civilian workforce and their allowances, renegotiate more of the hopeless PFI contracts signed in the last decade, and overhaul the way we buy equipment. But my right hon. Friend, the Prime Minister, has rightly been clear throughout that he is not prepared to see a reduction in Britain's military capabilities. <clears throat> this spending round not only protects those capabilities, but enhances them with the latest technologies. We will not cut the number of soldiers, sailors or airmen. We need them to defend our country. We will give them the best kit to do that job the new aircraft carriers, submarines, stealth fighters, destroyers and state-of-the-art armoured vehicles. And we also make a major commitment to invest in cyber. This is the new frontier of defence and a priority for this Government. 
We will look after the families who have lost their loved ones and those who have been injured protecting us long after the wars they fought in are over. We previously committed to fund the military covenant for five years. Today I will commit to fund the armed forces covenant permanently, and we will do this from the money we have collected from the LIBOR fines. Those who represented the very worst values will support those who represent the very best of British values. Our veterans will not be forgotten. The intelligence services are on the front line too. Silently and often heroically, these fellow citizens protect us and our way of life, and so we will protect them in return with a 3.4% increase in their combined resource budget. The Foreign Office is the public face of our diplomacy, and my right honourable friend, the Member for Richmond, is quite simply the best Foreign Secretary we have had in a generation. Yeah. He, too, he, too, has demonstrated how we can make our taxpayers' pounds go further. While making savings in his budget, he has managed to expand our network of embassies in the emerging world and focus his diplomats on Britain's commercial interests. There will be further savings in that budget of 8% in 2015, but my right honourable friend is still committing to strengthen our embassy network in high growth markets from Shanghai to Abuja. The Foreign Office protects our values abroad, and the Home Office protects our values here in Britain. Police reform is a model of what we can achieve across government. Police forces are more accountable to the public with modern working practices, the latest equipment, and democratic oversight. And all on a smaller. Yes, she is the best Home Secretary of Africa. that went before. And what was, what was the prediction from the benches opposite? They said crime would rise. And what has happened instead? Crime has fallen by more than 10 per cent, thanks to the hard work of the police officers up and down this country. Crime is at its lowest level for 30 years. And what was the prediction we heard from the benches opposite about the borders? They said the cuts would mean we were not going to be able to control immigration. And what has happened instead? Net immigration down by more than a third. This Home Secretary is demonstrating that responsible budgets and reform can deliver better services for the public. In 2015, she will work with a resource budget of £9.9 billion, a saving of 6 per cent. The police budget will be cut by less than that. There will be further savings in the central department. Police forces will be encouraged to share services, and some visa fees will go up. But protecting Britain from the terrorist threat remains a top priority, so I can confirm that the police counter-terrorism budget will not be cut at all. For the police to do their job, they need a criminal justice system that works a lot better. A case of common assault can take 240 days to pass through the courts, involves five separate sets of case papers, and is generated on three different computer systems. In some prisons, the cost of keeping a prisoner is £40,000 a year. In others, it is one third of that. And the cost of legal aid per head is double the European average. My right honourable friend, the Lord Chancellor, is reforming all of these things, and by doing that, he will make savings of 10 per cent in his departmental budget. And he will do that while offering, for the first time, probation services for those who have served short sentences to help end the revolving door of crime and reoffending. Mr. Speaker, it is an example of the reform we are bringing across government. And every step of the way, every penny saved, every programme reformed, every entitlement reduced, every difficult choice taken has been opposed by vested interests and those who got Britain into this mess in the first place. We will not let up. I will not let that happen. The reform will continue. <clears throat> now, Mr Speaker, government spending does not alone create sustainable growth enterprise does. And the job of the state is to provide the schools, the science, the transport links 
and the reliable energy that enable business to grow. Britain was once the place where the future was invented, from the railway to the jet engine to the World Wide Web. We can be that country again, and today we set out how to get there. A huge amount of innovation and discovery still goes on. But successive governments of all colours have put short-term pressures over the long-term needs and refused to commit capital spending plans that match the horizons of a modern economy. <laughs> Today, we change that. We commit now to £50 billion of capital investment in 2015. From roads to railways, bridges to broadband, science to schools, it will amount to over £300 billion of capital spending guaranteed to the end of this decade. Today, we raise our national game, and this means that Britain will spend, on average, more as a percentage of its national income on capital investment in this decade, despite the fact money is tight, than in the previous decade when government spending was being wasted in industrial quantities. Yeah. Mr Speaker, my right old friend, the Chief Secretary, will tomorrow set out the next stage of our economic infrastructure plan with specific plans for more than £100 billion of infrastructure projects. But this is what it means for departments. The Department for Transport will make a 9% saving in its day-to-day -day resource spending, bearing down on the running costs of Transport for London and on rail administration. But its capital budget will rise to £9.5 billion, the largest rise of any part of government. And we will repeat that commitment for every year to 2020. We're already massively expanding investment on major road schemes, but we will do more. So we're announcing the largest programme of investment in our roads for half a century. <coughs> We've already expanded our investment in the railways, but we will do more. So we're committing to the largest investment in our railways since the Victorian age. And with the legislation before this House today, we should give the green light to HS2, a huge boost to the north of England and a transformation of the economic geography of this country. Here in London, we're digging Crossrail, the largest urban infrastructure project in Europe. But we will do more, looking now at the case for Crossrail 2, linking London from north to south. And we're going to give the Mayor almost £9 billion of capital spending and additional financing power to the end of this decade. Mr. Well, he's a lot better than Ken Livingstone, that's for sure. <laughs> now, Mr. Speaker, investing in our economic infrastructure also means investing in energy. So we'll provide the certainty investors are crying out for in Western countries. This country is already spending more on renewables than ever before. Now we'll provide future strike prices for low carbon. We're restarting our civil nuclear program when other countries are unable to continue theirs. Now we provide guarantees for new nuclear. Already our exploitation of gas in the North Sea is second to none. Now we make the tax and planning changes that will put Britain at the forefront of exploiting shale gas. We will provide our country with the energy of the future at a price that we can afford. And taken together, this should support over £100 billion of private sector investment in energy. The Department for Energy and Climate Change will do this while reducing its resource budget by 8%. The Department for Environment and Rural Affairs will see a 10% reduction, but we will set out plans for a major commitment to new flood defences for the rest of this decade. Again, prioritising long-term capital through day-to-day -day cost savings, exactly the tough choice that Britain should be making. <laughs> Mr Speaker, it's not enough to have roads and power stations and flood defences. These are just the physical infrastructure you need to compete in the 21st century. We need the intellectual capital too. This country needs to invent and pioneer and export around the world. That means backing the Department for Business that helps us to do this, and it means taking tough decisions about what we should support. The Rhino, my run friend, the Business Secretary, has agreed to a reduction of 6% in the cost of the Department. That means we're making savings to student maintenance, keeping grants but not increasing them, and the cost of the Central Department will also be cut further. But this means 
that within this reduced budget, we can put more money into apprenticeships and continue with the dramatic increase in support we've provided to exporters through UKTI. Yeah. And we're not going to shift medical training and research out of this department because they're working well where they are. And in this department too, we can shift from day-to-day -day spending to a huge 9% increase in capital investment. This includes a huge investment in science. Scientific discovery is first and foremost an expression of the relentless human search to know more about our world, but it's also an enormous strength for a modern economy. From synthetic biology to graphene, Britain is very good at it, and we're going to keep it that way. I am committing today to maintain the resource budget for science at £4.6 billion, to increase the capital budget for science in real terms to £1.1 billion, and to maintain that real increase to the end of this decade. Yeah. Investment in science is an investment in our future. So yes, from the next generation of jet engines to cutting-edge supercomputers, we say, keep inventing, keep delivering. This country will back you all the way. But when you've got infrastructure and you've got science, you still need, Mr Speaker, the educated workforce to make it happen. And because of our ongoing reforms to our universities, they are now better funded than before. <laughs> well, Mr Speaker, people will remember that the reforms to higher education were bitterly contested in this House. We remember the scaremongering about fees, the claims that they would destroy social mobility, put off students from poorer communities applying, and what has happened since? The highest proportion of students from the most deprived neighbourhoods applying to universities ever. And we should all welcome that. But, Mr Speaker, there is no greater long-term investment a country can make than in the education and skills of its children. Because of the tough decisions we have taken elsewhere, we have been able to invest in education and accelerate school reform. Now, when we took office, our country's education system was falling behind other parts of the world. <clears throat> now, thanks to the brilliant programme of reform by my right honourable friend, the Education Secretary and the Schools Minister, we are once again leading the way. So we have applied our reform principles here too, freeing schools and teachers to concentrate on teaching and turning the majority of secondary schools into academies. In this spending round, this momentum for reform will grow. So the Education Department's overall budget will increase to £53 billion, and school spending will be protected in real terms, fulfilling the pledge we made at the beginning of this Parliament for all of this Parliament. And we will transfer power and money from town halls and central bureaucracy to schools, so that more of this money for education is spent on education. So while grants to councils and spending on central agencies are reduced, the cash going to schools will go up. And I can announce today that school spending will be allocated in a fairer way than ever before. <laughs> school funding across the country is not equally distributed. But distribution on a historical basis does not have a logical reason. The result is that some schools get much more than others in the same circumstances. It's unfair, and we are going to put it right. <laughs> Mr Speaker, many MPs from all sides of this House have campaigned for it. My honourable friend for Worcester has been a particular champion in this Parliament. <laughs> now the lowest funded local authorities in this country will at last receive an increase in their per-pupil funding as we introduce a national funding formula to ensure that no child in any part of our country is discriminated against. <laughs> and we will consult on all the details so we get this historic reform right. The pupil premium we have introduced also makes sure we are fair to children from low-income backgrounds. It will be protected in real terms, so every poor child will have more cash spent on their future than ever before. The capital budget will be set at £4.6 billion in 2015-16, with over £21 billion of investment over the next Parliament. 
we will tackle the backlog of maintenance in existing schools and we will invest in new school places. We will fund 20 new studio schools, 20 new university technical colleges. Those are outstanding new vocational institutions. <coughs> Mr Speaker, free schools are giving parents the opportunity to aspire to a better education for their children. The opposition have said they want no more of these schools. We can't allow that attack on aspiration to happen. Instead, we must accelerate the programme and bring more hope to children. That is why I can announce that we will fund an unprecedented increase in the number of free schools. We will provide for 180 great new free schools in 2015-16. <coughs> the schools budget protected, fairer funding across the nation, the pupil premium extended to more students than ever before, and a transformation in the free school programme. We will not make our children pay for the mistakes of the past. We will give them every chance for the future, because that is the single best investment that Britain can make. <laughs> Mr Speaker, our education settlement is also consistent with the third and final principle of this spending round, fairness. It is not possible to reduce a deficit of this size without asking all sections of the population to play their part, but those with the broadest shoulders should bear the greatest burden. And the Treasury distributional analysis shows that the top fifth of the population lose the most after this spending round. And the Independent Institute for Fiscal Studies are unequivocal that the richest 10 per cent have paid the most. In every year of this Parliament, the rich will pay a greater proportion of income tax revenues than in any one of the 13 years under the last Labour government. So when it comes to Her Majesty's revenue and customs, despite the fact that this department will see a 5 per cent reduction in its resource budget, we are committed to extra resources to tackle tax evasion. The result is that we expect to raise over a billion pounds more in tax revenues from those who try and avoid to pay their fair share. Mr Speaker, fairness also means refusing to balance the budget on the backs of the world's poorest. I know that not everyone believes we should fulfil our commitment to spend 0.7% of our national income on development, but I do. And I'm proud to support a government that is the first in our history to meet our pledge and meet it not only this year, but next year and the year after. <laughs> of course, overseas development is about more than just the DFID budget, and we comply with internationally policed rules. But the DFID budget is the lion's share, and it will be set at £11.1 billion pounds in 2015-16. Even in these tough times, the decisions we make mean we keep to our commitments. And that includes our commitment to the National Health Service, an institution which is the very embodiment of fairness in our society. <laughs> the NHS is much more than the government's priority. It is the people's priority. And when we came to office, the health budget was £96 billion. Pounds. In 2015-16, it will be £110 billion, pounds. <clears throat> and capital spending will rise to £4.7 billion. Pounds. New medical treatments and an ageing population means the demand for NHS services is rising. So we have not spared in also demanding reform and value for money in this service. This will not insulate the health service from tough choices. There are already 7,000 fewer managers, and the NHS will continue to make efficiency savings. But these savings will enable new investment in mental health and the funding for new treatments for cancers like prostate and breast cancer. And let me respond directly to the breast cancer research campaign that so many have taken part in. We will continue to back the Charity Research Support Fund and look into making it easier for these organisations to benefit from gift aid. Mr Speaker, many older people do not just use the NHS, they also use the social care system. And if we're honest, they often fall between the cracks of the two systems, being pushed from pillar to post and not getting the care they should. None of us here would want that for our parents or grandparents, and in a compassionate society, no one should endure it. It's a failure that also costs us billions of pounds, and Britain can do better. In the 2010 spending review, 
We said that the NHS would make available around a billion pounds a year to support the health needs of people in social care. It worked and saved hundreds of millions in the process. Last year, these improvements meant almost 50,000 fewer bed days were lost to the NHS. So today I can announce that I will be bringing together a significant chunk of the health and social care budgets. I want to make sure everyone gets a properly joined up service where they won't have to worry if that service is coming from the NHS or the local council. Let's stop the tragedy of people being dropped in A&E on a Friday night to spend the weekend in hospital because we can't look after them properly in social care. So by 2015-16, over £3 billion will be spent on services that are commissioned jointly and seamlessly by the local NHS and local councils working together. It's a huge and historic commitment of resources to social care tied to real reform on the ground to help end the scandal of older people trapped in hospitals because they cannot get a social care bed. <coughs> this will help relieve pressures on accident emergency, it will help local government deliver on its obligations, and it will save the NHS at least a billion pounds. Integrated health and social care, no longer a vague aspiration, but a concrete reality, transforming the way we look after people who need our care most. <laughs> so, Mr Speaker, these are the three principles that guide the spending round, reform, growth and fairness. And nowhere could these principles be clearly, more clearly applied than in our approach to welfare. Two groups of people need to be satisfied with our welfare system. Those who need it, who are old, who are vulnerable, who are disabled, who have lost their job, and who we as a compassionate society want to support. And there's a second group, the people who pay for this welfare system, who go out to work, who pay their taxes, and expect it to be fair on them too. So we've taken huge steps to reform welfare changing working age benefits with universal credit so the work always pays, removing child benefit from the better off, capping benefits so no family out of work gets more than the average family gets in work, and we've been making sure benefit payments don't rise faster than wages. The steps we've taken will save £18 billion a year, and every single one of them was opposed by the Welfare Party opposite. Now we propose to do three further welfare reforms. First, as I said in the budget, we are going to introduce a new welfare cap to control the overall costs of the benefit bill. We have already capped the benefits of individuals, and now we cap the system as a whole. Under that system we inherited, welfare spending was put into a category called annually managed expenditure. But the problem was it wasn't managed at all. And the cost of welfare went up by a staggering 50% even before the crash. Our welfare cap will stop that happening again. The cap will be set each year of the budget for four years. It will apply from April 2015. It will reflect forecast inflation, but it will be set in cash terms. In future, when a government looks to breach the cap, because it's failing to control welfare, the OBR will issue a public warning, and the government will then be forced to take action to cut welfare costs or publicly breach the cap and explain that to Parliament. We'll exclude a small number of the most cyclical benefits that directly rise and fall with the unemployment rate to preserve the automatic stabilisers, <coughs> housing benefit, tax credits, disability benefits and pensioner benefits will all be included but the state's pension will not be. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I've had representations that we should include the basic state pension in the welfare cap. That would mean that a future government could offset a rise in working age benefits by cutting the pensions of older people. <laughs> that penalises those who've worked hard all their lives. Cutting pensions to pay for working age benefits is a choice this government is certainly not prepared to make. It's unfair. We won't do it, and we reject those representations completely. The new welfare cap is proof that Britain is serious about living within its means, controlling spending, protecting the taxpayer, fundamentally fair. 
Today, we are introducing a limit on the nation's credit card. The principles enshrined in the cap apply to our second reform today. We will act to ensure that we will stop the cost of paying the winter fuel payments made to those who live abroad rising, rising in a way that no one ever intended. EU law now says that people living in the European economic area can claim winter fuel payments from us even if they didn't get them before they left the UK. Paying out even more money to people from all nationalities who may have worked in this country years ago but no longer live here is not a fair use of the nation's cash. So from the autumn of 2015, we will link the winter fuel payment to a temperature test. People in hot countries will no longer get it. It is, after all, a payment for winter fuel. <laughs> Mr Speaker, the third welfare reform I announced today is about making sure we do everything to help people get into work. <laughs> My Honourable Friend, the Work and Pension Secretary, has changed the national debate about welfare and he has comprehensively won the argument. <laughs> he has committed to finding a further 9.5 per cent savings in his department's running costs. That will require a difficult drive for efficiency and a hard-headed assessment of underperforming programmes. <laughs> but welfare reform is about much more than saving money, vital though that is. It's about reducing dependency and changing people's lives for the better. I'm determined to go further to reduce worklessness with all its social consequences. Where is the fairness in condemning people to a life on benefits because the system won't help them get back into work? So today we're introducing upfront work search. We're going to make sure people turn up with a CV register for online job search and start looking for work, and only then will they get their benefits. Thanks to this government, lone parents out there can now get, lone parents who are out of work can now get free childcare for all their three and four year olds, so it's reasonable to ask that they start regularly attending job centres and preparing to return to work. There are further changes we announced today. Half of all job seekers need more help looking for work. So we'll require them to come to the job centre every week rather than once a fortnight. And we're going to give people more time with job centre advisors and proper progress reviews every three months. And we're going to introduce a new seven-day wait before people can claim their benefits. Those first few days should be spent looking for work, not looking to sign on. We're doing these things because we know they help people stay off benefits and help those on benefits get back into work faster. And here's a farther, further change. From now on, if claimants don't speak English, they will have to attend language courses until they do. This is a reasonable requirement in this country. It will help people to find work. But if you're not prepared to learn English, your benefits will be cut. <laughs> Taken together, this new contract with people on benefits will save over £350 million a year. And all that money will enable us to afford extra support to help people get into work. Help to work, incentives to work, and an expectation that people should do everything they can to find work. That's fair for people out of work, and it's fair for those in work who pay for them. Together, these reforms bring the total additional welfare savings in 2015 up to £4 billion. Mr Speaker, step by step, this reforming government is making sure that Britain lives within its means. <laughs> the decisions we take today are not easy, and these are difficult times. But with this statement, we make more progress towards an economy that prospers, a state we can afford, a deficit coming down, and a Britain on the rise. And I commend this economic plan to the country. Mr Ed Balls. Mr, Mr Speaker, the uh, Chancellor spoke for over 50 minutes. He spoke for over 50 minutes, but not once 
did he mention the real reason for this spending review today, his comprehensive failure on living standards growth and on the deficit too. Prices rising faster than wages, families worse off, long-term unemployment up, welfare spending soaring, the economy flatlining, the slowest recovery for over 100 years, and the result of this failure for all the budget boasts Borrowing last year not down but up, Mr. Speaker. Not balancing the books as he promised, but in 2015, a deficit of £96 billion. More borrowing to pay for his economic failure. That is why this Chancellor has been forced to come to the House today to make more cuts to our public services. So, Mr. Speaker, let me ask the Chancellor. Does he recall what he said to this House two years ago? He said, we have already asked the British people for what is needed and we do not need to ask for more. We do not need to ask for more. Isn't his economic failure the reason why he is back here asking for more today? More cuts to the police, more cuts to our defence budgets, more cuts to our local services. This out-of-touch Chancellor has failed on living standards, growth and the deficit, and families and businesses are paying the price for his failure. And of course, Mr Speaker, it wasn't supposed to turn out like this. Let me ask the Chancellor, does he remember what he told the House three years ago in his first budget and spending review? He said the economy would grow by 6%, but it's grown by just 1%. He pledged to get the banks lending, but bank lending is down month on month on month. He made the number one test of his economic credibility, keeping the AAA credit rating, but on his watch, we've been downgraded not once but twice, Mr Speaker. He promised living standards would rise but they're falling year on year on year. He said we're all in this together, but then he gave a huge tax cut to millionaires, Mr Speaker. He promised to balance the books, and that promise is in tatters. Failed tests, broken promises. His friends call him George. The President calls him Geoffrey. But to everyone else, he's just bungle, Mr Speaker. And, uh, I can see uh, I can see uh, I can see I can see uh, even an even zippy on the front bench can't stop smiling Mr Speaker Calm down zippy calm down And did we get an admission that his plan has worked that Britain needs to change course did we get the plan B for growth and jobs that we and the International Monetary Fund have called for? Mr Speaker, it doesn't have to be this way. Instead of planning cuts in 2015, two years ahead, surely the Chancellor should be taking bold action now to boost growth this year and next. Investment that would get our economy growing, get the tax revenues coming in, more revenues, which would mean our police, our uh, armed forces and public services would not face such deep cuts in 2015. Let me ask the uh, Chancellor, why didn't he listen to the International Monetary Fund and bring forward £10 billion in infrastructure investment this year? With house building at the lowest level since the 20s, why isn't he building 400,000 more affordable homes this year and next? Mr Speaker, if the Chancellor continues with his failing economic plan, it will be for the next Labour government to turn the economy round, to take the tough decision to get the deficit down in a fair way, Mr Speaker. But I have to say, I have to say to the Chancellor, I have to say to the Chancellor that there is no point boasting about infrastructure investment in five or seven years' time. We need action now, Mr yeah. Speaker. 
And I have to say to him, he ought to brief the Prime Minister better for Prime Minister's questions. Because three years after the infrastructure plan was launched, out of 576 projects announced, just seven completed, over 80% not even started, just one school, Mr Speaker, and in the first three months of this year, infrastructure investment down by 50%. On infrastructure, we need bold action now, not just more empty promises for the future. And as for the idea this spending review is going to strengthen our economy for the long term, let me ask him, where is the proper British investment bank that business wants? Where's the 2030 decarbonisation target which the energy companies say they need to be able to invest for the future? Where is the backstop power to break up the banks if there's not reform which the parliamentary commissioners call for? And I have to say, Whatever happened to the Hesseltine plans, much heralded £49 billion single pot growth fund for the regions, £2 billion? It's pathetic, Mr. Speaker. Isn't this the truth? Instead of action to boost growth and long term investment, all we got today is more of the same from a failing Chancellor and more of the same on social security and welfare spending, too. We've had plenty of tough talk and divisive rhetoric from the Chancellor and the Prime Minister. But on their watch, the benefits bill is soaring. Social Security is up £21 billion compared to their plans. Mr Speaker, we've called for a cap on Social Security. We, 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 are fully, we, fully, we fully support the triple lock on the pension, something not even mentioned in the Chancellor's statement, Mr Speaker. But I have to say, the fact is, the Chancellor tried to set a cap in 2010 on Social Security spending, and he's overspent his cap by £21 billion. Let me say to the Chancellor, if he really wants to get the bills of Social Security down, why not get young people and the unemployed back to work? compulsory jobs guarantee paid for by a tax on bank bonuses. Why not get our housing benefit bill down by tackling high rents and the shortage of affordable homes? Why not stop paying the winter allowance to the richest 5% of pensioners? And why not make work pay with a mansion tax for a Tempe tax ban instead of huge tax cuts for millionaires, Mr Speaker? And, Mr Speaker, the Chancellor is making the wrong choices on growth and social security, and he's making the wrong choices on departmental spending as well. Let me ask him, when thousands of frontline police officers are being cut, why is he spending more on police commissioners than the old police authorities? Why is he doing that? Why is he wasting three billion pounds on a reckless NHS reorganisation the public doesn't support? Why is he funding new free schools in areas with enough school places while parents in other areas can't get their children into a local school? Mr Speaker, we will study his departmental spending plans for 2015-16. There was a lot of detail he didn't provide for the House. We look forward to seeing whether he's going to confirm the continuation of free National Museum entry. Maybe you can tell us in his response. But I have to say to the Chancellor, the country needs to know the detail. So let me ask him, will this spending review mean fewer police officers in 2015-16 on top of the 15,000 we're losing in this Parliament? Is it going to mean fewer nurses in 2015 on top of the 4,000 we've lost so far? Will it mean fewer Sure Start children's centres on top of the 500 already closed? And will he continue to impose deeper cuts on local authorities in areas with the greatest need when already in this Parliament the 10 most deprived local authorities are losing six times the spending per head of the ten least deprived areas. Mr Speaker, people up and down the country want to know the answers to these questions, and they should be in no doubt. 
at the scale of the extra cuts the Chancellor has announced today to our police, defence and local services are the direct result of his abject failure to get the economy to grow. Mr Speaker, the Chancellor is failing on living standards. They're falling. He's failed on growth. It's flatlining. He's failing on the deficit, and all we got was more of the same. No plan to turn the economy round, no hope for the future, and Britain's families and our public services are paying the price for this Chancellor's failure. Chancellor of the Exchequer. Well, well, Mr Speaker, one thing's uh, for certain after that performance, he's the worst Shadow Chancellor for a generation. And we want to keep him right where he is. What's amazing is he spoke for 11 minutes and never said Labour wants to borrow more. Did anyone hear that in his comment? That is his argument. He wants to borrow more. Why doesn't he have the courage to get up and make his economic argument at this dispatch box? He finds himself in this situation where his entire argument that he has been advancing for the last three years has completely collapsed. Where was the reference to the temporary VAT cut? Abandoned. Where was the reference to the five-point plan? Abandoned. He complains about all the cuts. Here's a very simple question. We're going to spend £745 billion in 2015. What is he going to spend? Does he match those plans or not? Just hands up on the Labour benches. Who wants to match our spending plans? On Saturday, the Labour leader... Oh, order. Order. Can I just say... Order. No help from the honourable gentleman is required. He wouldn't have the foggiest idea where to start. Let me just say to the Chancellor of the Exchequer, there is a way in which these matters are handled, and it's not by the Minister responding to questions, posing a series of questions. It's in breach of parliamentary protocol, it's not proper, and it must stop straight away. And others, including at the very highest level, ought to take note of that for future weeks. Let's be clear about it. The Chancellor. Mr Speaker. I will, I will leave it to the country to ask these questions. I make this point. In this spending plan, I have set out total managed expenditure for £745 billion, and it's up for all members of this House to decide whether they support that. And we don't know what the position of the opposition is, because on Saturday they said, the Labour leader, there would be no more borrowing. On Sunday, the Shadow Chancellor said yes, of course, there would be. So we will see what the position of the opposition is on this. And he mentions what has been said in this House before. Well, let's be clear what he said in this House before and how we responded to it in this spending plan. On the 6th of June 2011, he said there was going to be a return to mass unemployment. But well, we've set out welfare plans that help people get, get back into work. Does he support those or not? That's the question the public will ask of him. He said in October 2010 that we were taking a huge risk with crime. Crime is down 10 per cent or more. He said in July that year that the university reforms would shut out those from disadvantaged backgrounds from university. And actually, a record proportion of pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds applied to go to university. He said, in his own words, the cuts to the border agency would mean we'd be unable to enforce our immigration policy. That was wrong too. Every previous prediction he made every prediction, including the prediction there be no more boom and bust, has proved to be completely wrong. And why would anyone believe a word he has got to say about this at all? The simple point is this, Mr Speaker. We've set out our plans. We've set out our economic strategy. We've set out our spending plans. Those who disagree with them advance an alternative or retreats from the battlefield, because he finds himself in no man's land. He has abandoned his economic argument, 
but stuck with a disastrous economic policy of borrowing more. And in the end, Mr. Speaker, if you want to know why, it is this. He said this this month. Do I think the last Labour government was profligate, spent too much, had too much national debt? No, I don't think there's any evidence for that at all. All people want them to say is, we're sorry, we got it wrong, we borrowed too much, we spent too much, we won't do it again. And in a specific answer to the question he asked me, yes, we will have free museum charges so that people can go to our museums and see the antiquated economic policy advanced by the government party opposite that brought this country to its knees, gave us the worst economic crisis for a generation, and they can learn how this government cleared up that mess. Yeah.